Good morning, Craig. Hello there. Hey. How are you, kind of people? Good. Hi, hi, hi. Greetings, greetings. John, I have to reply to your email. I shall do so today, but thank you. That's a okay. yeah. an awesome thing. All right. <clears throat> um, Doug, how are things in your neck of the woods? Well, um, you know, we've had incredible weather this last week. Uh, because we're at the coast, it's been uh, wonderfully in the low 70s. Mm -hmm. uh, people are going to restaurants and poking around, but the people here are have the kind of affluence that lets them do that. So this neck of the woods is pretty good. Uh, um, where the neck connects up with the rest of the body animal political <laughs> yeah. story. Exactly. Uh, now, I've been hearing a little bit of worry about the coming fire season. Is that like in the air at all, or is everybody kind of pretty uh, calm right now? Definitely. Everybody is making preparations. Um, Doug, what, count, what, what counts as good preparations? Uh, making sure that, you, that your car has full, is full of gas. Uh, that you've got some food in the car, that you've taken care of what your animals are going to do, mm -hmm. um, and talking to neighbors. Yes. Uh, I went and talked to the fire chief and said, what do you think? He said, don't worry, we'll put it out. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay, that's amazing. I so, the fire chief. You know, the thing is, it... it Every 80 years or so, it burns through here anyway. The whole right. state burns. Uh, and it's just our short memories that don't remember such things. Well, no, it's actually uh, different than that. That's, that's the fire ecology of California. But given, now, given urban penetration and forest management, there's a lot more, it's a lot more, a lot more frequency and impact. Yeah. We're in a very good position because we're actually on the river. So the, the worst case scenario is we go and get our kayaks and go down to the ocean. Yeah. Yeah. Not bad. Yeah. So he, he, here in Berkeley, we don't, it is, we're, we're in the flats of Berkeley, so we don't feel direct fire risk, but the air quality issue is a big one. And so yeah. our main move is investing heavily in air fires. Air fires. That seems to be all we can do. Yeah, uh, Gil, your voice is sort of muffled somehow. I don't know why, but I'm having trouble hearing you, even though you're standing, you're sitting right over your laptop. Or yeah, let me keep my settings. Everything. <clears throat> yeah, and I don't think you have any earbuds or anything in, so. so I was kind of struggling to hear you. Is it better now? Uh, any better? A little bit. Okay, yep. let's try this. Yep. Pick up the volume here. Is that better now? Hey, Mark. Uh, yeah, that's better. Better. Yes, that is okay. better. Okay, thanks. Actually, that's substantially better right now. Stacy, yes. Maybe when too I, much better. When, when I click on where the chat is and I go to the sign in, it says the page not found. Any suggestions what I could do? Is anybody else having trouble with that link? The one I just put in the chat? Correct. Because uh, I pulled that link straight out of my Mattermost app, which is running on my desktop. And I think that's the right link to the Mattermost, but also Zoom Zoom chat might do some funny things to the link. Okay. So here. Oh, it came up now. Now it just came up when I click back to it. Cool. Okay, thank you. Oh, thank you, Stacey. Can you, can you post it again? Because I just logged in and it's- you, you bet. Let me go back to the chat and paste it one more time. Right there. That's me, Signore. Perfect. I have another tech question if somebody could help me. Excellent. How do I how do I split the screen so I could see all of you on Zoom and see that chat? Are you on Windows or on a Mac? Windows. I don't know. Anybody, <laughs> anybody on anybody on Windows? So you can down at the can. bottom there, Stacy, just click the chat button. Well, the, yeah, I can nope. I can get no, I can get that, but then it's one or the other. I can either see the conversation. Or the call. I can't see both. So if you if you drag your the 
title bar of your Zoom call, unless it's full screen. I, the problem with Zoom yeah, is you escape. have to make it not full screen first. I think Try escape to get out of full screen. Yeah. And then when I'm you're out, out of full, full I'm out of full screen. Okay. okay. And I'm going to I'm going to mirror you to like, the right. Yeah. Uh, now you can. Now you should be able to slide the the window that has uh, the Zoom on it. I understand what you're saying. I can see the chat and I can see the call. Once I click the link in the chat, it just takes me to full screen on the. Um, it's okay. okay. It's okay. Yeah. I don't want to take up that much time. Yeah. So you you can also escape full screen on the on the Mattermost. I've I've got it on. What you're talking about exactly? I did I I did, did the exact same thing. It went to okay. full screen Mattermost, but then I okay. escape full screen, shrink it down, bring back the Zoom, line them up next to each other. So if you were on Mac, I did, and I'm, I'm assuming Windows has a similar trick, but I discovered that if you mouse, over, you know how Windows have like a, a, a full screen, hide it, close window, little buttons on the upper left. Yeah. Um, so I discovered that on Mac, if you hover, if you hover over that, it gives you more options. One of which is tile this to the right. So what I do when we get in this call is I go to my Mattermost app. I tile it to the right, and then I pick Zoom as the thing to show on the left. And so right this minute, I have basically all of our windows are on the left uh, as you want them, Stacy. And the chat from Mattermost has replaced basically the Zoom chat. Okay. Now, how to do that, on how to achieve that on Windows is a mystery to me. But <laughs> this, this works really well for me on, on the Mac. So okay, Windows, I'll, I'll play around. I'm going to just go off camera. <laughs> and, and I think Bentley is doing a screen share right now to show you. Yeah. Oh. Unfortunately, Zoom screws up the screen share, so I can't. But in Windows, when you can move your window around, if you just drag it all the way to the side and let go, it'll dock it. Oh. And then it'll give you an option on what the other window you want to be to come up. Uh, and then you could you could do the okay that was fabulous, window, which I have to show my other thing. But um, so the that's, that's kind of how you how you do it. The Thank standard you. technique for Windows is to. The window that you're focused on, press down your win key and press arrow left. For those that want to memorize keys. <laughs> key strokes, yeah. If there's the a other option is if you're on the win, if you if you're on the zoom screen, hold down the win key, which is between control and alt, and press yep. arrow left. That window will then occupy half the screen. And on the left, I guess. Get, yeah, and you yeah. should get tiles for all the other screens and you select the other one that you want to occupy the right hand side of your screen. So these are two ways of doing the same thing, Stacey. Is either one working for you? I'm going to, I'm going to focus on as you guys are talking, I'm going to work on it. Thank you. <laughs> the other Brilliant. option is, is to right click your start bar at the bottom and there's an option <clears throat> for show side by side, but that's only if you have only two things open. Okay. The other option is to draw everybody's face on little post-its and, and stick them on your screen so that they represent <laughs> where the people normally would be. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you all. That's probably I'll, I'll let you know how I do. Cool. Um, cool. Uh, Gil, do you want to check in first? Then we'll start with you since you have to head out. And you don't have to head out right away, but no, let, me, we... let me go third because I'm uh, getting breakfast put together and need to sit down. So, oh, okay. Let's, 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 let's go. Up. Let's go a different way then. Um, let me go with Klaus Michael Bentley. Klaus, Klaus wasn't ready. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, yeah. Um, the uh, I mean, this has been uh, a crazy week. Uh, we we had um, uh, discussions around. Um, what is happening in Israel? Obviously, um, having having such uh, a profound impact on on so many uh, uh, the people, really. And and as you know, my my, my daughter you know, married a young man from Tel Aviv and really got into this hosting of uh, um, some really violent uh, messaging. <clears throat> and I posted. Uh, um, a conversation by uh, Yuval Harari and uh, a neuroscientist, uh, a famous neuroscientist from from uh, 
from Israel who um, engaged in a discussion on the um, difficulty we have to maintain um, a, a realistic perspective on the events around us um, because of so much manipulation and so much uh, a misunderstanding. But what it boils down to is what both of them were saying, what Yuval Harari was really driving home is that we don't really have any space left for that kind of conflict because um, the Middle East, for example, is flat running out of water. Uh, there are already climate refugees uh, around uh, the, the area. <coughs> can only get <coughs> John, can you mute real quick? Yeah. Thanks. And uh, and uh, there are there are projections that the Middle East will be basically become uninhabitable in in uh, in in, uh, in 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 the entire region. Um, you're looking at like Syria, uh, Iraq, Yemen, and so on. And so it's uh, um, just an expression of the difficulty we are having to elevate uh, climate change and, and environmental um, uh, destruction that we are causing to, to a point where uh, it focuses our attention and we haven't reached that point yet. Uh, because every conflict we have right now, every, we, we are destroying the very infrastructure that we need to, uh, to restore the very uh, uh, world we, we live in. Um, as, as we, the, the, we need infrastructure to build the, the um, uh, regeneration of, of the land. So that was, and, and that, that is really echoing around uh, a number of conversations which are really intensifying. You know, I see that uh, I've been asked to develop a, a webinar on biofuels by uh, business climate leaders. <clears throat> and as I'm diving into the topic of biofuels, you realize we're flat running out of water in the United States. Now you have California trying up, um, so let me so well, but let's go to the Mississippi River Delta and relocate some of that agriculture into that region. Well, you realize for the last two years they were wiped out to the west flooding. You go further north and you see the Ogallala Aquiver being pumped dry, you know, to create to, to raise corn for biofuel. So there is so much, so much happening in the in the sphere, you know, of uh, uh, of our environment that the last thing we can afford is climate change and I mean so is conflict and and the um, the, the the point that was that you will Harari was also driving home is that we cannot uh, bring people to the point of desperation you know? and 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 if if you have all these tribal conflicts it doesn't matter if it's Israel and Palestinians or the Turkish with the Kurds or you know Myanmar with the Rohingyas or China, I mean, it doesn't matter. You know, it's, it, there's these tribal conflicts uh, happening all around the world, and they are completely derailing our response to to uh, to to this climate change. And what Yuval Harari was really emphasizing is the moment you drive people into desperation, where they are facing an existential challenge, they do desperate things. Desperate people do desperate things. And so I think that that is that <clears throat> to 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 bring that into consciousness and into the awareness of people, you know, that we we really have to we really have very little time left, and this year is going to be incredibly crazy important uh, because we are uh, once we are passing you know, certain trigger points, then we are and we are moving into a downward spiral for let's say food supply, for example which is you know, a very real and present uh, challenge, then we are, then, then uh, we may be, you know, it may, it may, it may be too late to fix anything. And, and so my, <clears throat> um, it, it, it's just, it's just a very burdensome thing uh, to, to look at and to deal with. Uh, yeah. So anyway, that was my morning. <laughs> wow. Um, and just just before you said the word desperation, 
I was realizing that I'm tracking the same crises you're tracking. And I, I read the article you posted about um, agriculture maybe moving to the Delta or wherever because California is drying up and all of that. And I'm way too aware of all our aquifers being dried up and all that. And I realized that I'm a, I'm busy avoiding despair myself, that I'm like skirting, skirting the edges of this shit's really bad. And there's, there's like crisis upon crisis on top of like refugee crises that are sort of precipitated by all these crises. And in the middle of all this, we're in political lockup in so many different ways. Um, and, and they're trying to get Bibi out of power now in Israel. And, and I have a thought from two years ago that says, you know, is Bibi finally out? Because two years ago, it looked like his reign was over in Israel and it wasn't, he stayed in power. So right now I'm like, just kind of watching to, to see what happens. Uh, and OGM exists in part because our inability to speak across these divides has us in lockup everywhere rather than acting in concert or at least in uh, jazz um, to solve these things. Yeah, and the, the, the tragedy really is that if we could get our act together, there is so much positive about this, right? Because there, there, there is so much we could be doing to, uh, to provide a vision and to provide um, uh, the, the kind of guidance, particularly in the agriculture sector, which is now what we're, what we're working on, but to, to, to help people help themselves and create uh, uh, the, the, the story, right? That, that people need to have in their minds in order to become uh, hopeful and, and, and positive and engaged. And, and that's the, we are so close to, to getting to this point, but, um, you know, there's just the next skirmish because somebody wants to stay in power, starts another war somewhere. Yeah. Totally agree. Thank you. Gil? Yeah. Um, yeah, BB may be getting out of power, but what's coming in may not be a whole lot better. Right? Right. Seen that. Um, Klaus, thanks for the share. I'm, I just came across a, a, a quote from the Tasmanian author uh, Richard Flanagan yesterday. He's actually doing a book reading tonight. Uh, he said, despair is always rational, but hope is human. And so, you know, it really struck me that that's kind of, you know, there's lots of logic for despair. Plus, as you said, there's, you know, there's enormous amounts of creative activity going on all over the planet, and it's not highly visible in the mainstream, but there's thrilling innovation and momentum and coherence among very, you know, I mean, the number of these kinds of conversations that are happening on Zoom every day is just stunning to me. I can barely keep up. Um, I'm struck listening to you by a number of things. Uh, one is desperation. Um, and, um, you know, as the climate shit hits the fan and more and more people realize in, at whatever level their lives are disordered, there's, there's a psychological and social disruption that we can barely anticipate. That's on the way. I've long thought that what we've described as, as economic depressions are actually psychological phenomena. Um, and there's a, there's a version of that on steroids possibly headed toward us. Um, I'm struck by the, you know, the, the conjunction of the traditional blindness of human beings to exponential change. We just don't know how to see that on our landscape. Um, our blindness to living systems. Um, the, um, um, you know, the, the 20th century phenomenon of organized propaganda, uh, both political and commercial. Uh, now the phenomenon of, of active organized disinformation campaigns on a global scale. There was a posting last, earlier this week that they traced most of the vaccine disinformation to 12 actors. Not stealth Russian people, actually visible people in the world of anti-vaccine. So for you know, 12 people have generated that flurry. And then on top of that, we've got the phenomenal political polarization that Jerry, you just alluded to, you know, I think of it as a shredded social fabric and people who can't speak to each other uh, and the perhaps slowly accelerating slow motion coup in the United States. Um, I'm pretty concerned. Uh, you know, but so between, you know, between the threat of climate emergency and the threat of fascism, uh, it's a scary time. So I wonder, Klaus, did Harari and Bialik have anything uh, um, positive or prescriptive to suggest in their talk, or was it all diagnosis of doom? Uh, Yuval Harari's <clears throat> major theme is that survival is optional. Yeah. Yeah, and and uh, so it's a choice. It's our choice. It's our decision, and um, 
I mean, as you dig deeper into into the trends that 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 you can observe here, um, that option is that window of of opportunity is closing. I mean, it it really is because once you have millions of people moving because yeah. their food supply is gone, uh, it will become uh, incredibly more difficult to. I, to I, I, I get that. That's still diagnostic. Did the doctor offer any prescription? If survival was optional, what are the steps or moves or directions or considerations he would suggest taking to improve odds of survival, or is that not where he plays? Well, the last 10 minutes of the conversation uh, is would really respond to, to your question. And <clears throat> particularly, they were saying we have to, uh, in Israel, you know, we have to look at issues of inequity, access to vaccines, for example, access to medical care. Yeah. Uh, but basically, the, what I what I call uh, uh, desperation basically mitigates uh, the desperation of people and 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 uh, in, integrate them into a society that is livable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, John, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I can jump in, and this can be my um, intro also because I'm going to have to leave at about a little after nine. So, first to not not to add too much to the negative, but there was a pretty toxic conversation going on on Clubhouse last night. Um, it was um, it was a bunch of anti-wokes people, you know, talking about how uh, free conversation and freedom of speech, et cetera, being shut down, people being kicked out of uh, positions. It's a bunch of academics. I mean, I, you know, I completely understand their, their uh, discomfort with what's happening. And I, I agree with the discomfort, but I'm very upset by what happens when they start that conversation. Uh, it it picked up, you know, that people started making analogies to anti-Semitism. Some of the strongest uh, objectors uh, to the wokeism happen to be Jewish. You know, so, so then you start, you start to see this unfortunate coming together of, of difficulty uh, in the conversation. And again, it's a, it was a predominantly conservative conversation, although a couple of very visibly, whatever you want to call them, liberal, whatever, uh, folks, very, very pro-science folks were um, saying, you know, hey, we can't do science. You know, the, the physics is one of the few remaining places where you, you can't do this kind of um, anti-science argument, but they were, they were afraid it was going to lose out and that, that, that even natural science research would be subjected to um, some kind of norms, subjective norms uh, is basically what they're talking about. So that's the negative. What's the positive? Um, <clears throat> I don't, <laughs> I, Har Harari, I missed the latest conversation. Earlier in his, his work, he's talked a lot about uh, viable myths and that we need uh, viable myths, you know, something that's, okay, not exactly true, certainly not provable, but true enough. It, it kind of covers, it, it creates a, an accessible uh, philosophy of, of interaction uh, and explanation that works for a lot of people and keeps them from killing each other. Um, so that's, you know, a direction to think about. Another direction to think about is um, post postmodern, uh, you know, what, what, you know, we'd like to have, is, is, is there sort of like a, a minimal, something that overlaps what we now call civility, but doesn't use that word civility. It overlaps what we might call uh, minimum right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of not being killed. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like, you know, it, I, I'm imagining a kind of a rights package that that even people who don't like other people intensely agree, oh, that's that's a reasonable solution. I, you know, I'm, I'm willing to grant everybody this minimum rights package, and then we'll proceed from there to do the finer details about, you know, whether you, who gets this job or who gets to move up and down in the hierarchy. And, and part of that is a floor under which you don't let people sink, uh, you know, and that's you know, healthcare, maybe maybe basic income, I don't know. Some, there's some, we, we need to get more creative down there about defining the floor. And then 
and then just do some really positive work on uh, appreciative differences. You know, like we were able to fix this problem because this person who you would never imagine, you know, had this idea. And we just need to multiply those things and use the social media multiplier techniques to keep reminding people that it is, in fact, the diverse. I mean, the, the investors know this. The investors know women on the board company does better, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we need to just multiply those situations. But also, I think there's there's real serious philosophical work. It needs to be done to come up with a post equality civility and that can be extended to people who you don't like a lot that aren't, aren't members of your tribe but that you're willing to live with because you get that there's benefits to you from doing it that way thanks john you're reminding me of a video i posted into our mattermost i think in town hall uh, about a woman named Max Liboiron, who is a Métis and a scientist and is, uh, has focused recently on plastics, uh, you know, microplastics in the oceans and stuff like that. But the video was a really nice bridge between what's troubling communities and regular humans, how science can work with them to solve problems, uh, making, taking multiple different perspectives on the science, uh, uh, being like seeking out diversity. There, there, there were a whole bunch of other threads in, in, in the video that seemed really healthy for me uh, toward the kind of things that you're, you're talking about. Because, because sometimes when you try to take, when we try to focus on just discourse and just bridging the divide, that doesn't sort of work so well. We need to get together and do something else that's fruitful, that addresses some of our concerns. And then we figure out, oh, okay, this, this actually sort of works together maybe. Um, so anyway, that was inspiring to me. Can that go in Mattermost? <laughs> uh, yes, I'll, I'll bring it back uh, and, and post it to the, to the Mattermost chat right here. Uh, let's go Michael Bentley Stacy. Hi all, um, good to see you. I'm, I'm uh, in Berkeley still and uh, um, enjoying conversations that are a little different than the ones that I have on the East Coast. Um, and um, was talking to some folks last night, rushing around the idea that I just want to throw out here about um, about harnessing some of the concepts behind the NFT um, craze in the art area, particularly. I'm getting a message, by the way, that my my connection is unstable. Can you guys hear me? Okay. You're breaking up a bit on us, but go mm -hmm. ahead. Okay. Yeah, we're hearing you okay, or I would have interrupted more. Okay. Um, so um, the notion that I'm sure most of you have heard um, in the art NFT market of 10% um, of the appreciation of an asset in a subsequent sale returning to the creator of that art um, is an interesting concept, whether it used NFTs or not to um, attach to other areas of inequality, both over time and in space. Um, and um, I was imagining the idea of the real estate market, um, both cushioning the effects and de-incentivizing gentrification um, by benefiting the early um, owners and people who live in an area um, because even if they were, even if prices rose and they were forced out, they would continue to derive benefit from the fact that they'd been there. Um, and this could also work along supply chains from raw materials to finished products, um, you know, crops that were grown, um, materials that were mined. Um, if, if a portion of the upsell or the, the you know, appreciation along the supply chain returned to, to benefit creators and just reduced inequality that way. And I just thought that's a concept I'd like to throw out in, in OGM world, see if anybody's heard about any 
anything like this and uh and or just let people cogitate on it and see if uh it leads anywhere thanks michael and i just posted to the Mattermost chat. I did the Liberon link, but then also, uh, as you started talking, there was a nice article about the Beeple uh, NFT sale and so forth. And, and the article was pretty deep and it quoted an, another artist named Sarah Ludi, who not only, uh, there's, there seems among artists doing NFTs, which is suddenly like a big thing, uh, cause like, hey, free money, let's try that. Um, there's this assumption that 10% goes back to the artist, but what she did was she did a different, she negotiated other kinds of terms. So if you start thinking of these as smart contracts um, and you start playing with that idea, I think it's really rich in the way you just described, Michael. And I don't think enough people are working on that. And I'm afraid, I'm afraid, I'm weird to say, I'm afraid that the NFT thing is going to vanish before we figure that part out. And then there's this whole other thread about how dangerous NFTs and blockchain are to the world because of the energy they consume. We can sort of set that aside a little bit too. Uh, and then I also want to add in something that Vincent has been bringing in front of us, which maybe Pete can explain because I can't, which is the token, uh, curated token, wait, what's it called, Pete? Uh, token curated registries. I think yes, the... yes, which is a way of using NFTs uh, to reward people for good curation, I think is a way too short way of explaining it. But, the, but there's a lot of interesting layers here that we're not really exploring. Go ahead, Pete. Um, uh, thanks, thanks for bringing it up, Michael. And let me differentiate NFTs from smart contracts. So NFTs are kind of a, uh, <laughs> I'm going to say something opinionated. Uh, NFTs currently, current NFTs are a stupid way of using smart contracts. Um, and it, it looks to me like a cul-de-sac. Um, so there is a lot of, uh, valence around the term NFT. Um, mm -hmm. And there's, there are certainly good things happening and there's certainly bad things happening, really, really bad things happening. The energy is one problem. And just the fact of taking, um, taking art, digital art and making it so that it's a, a unique thing is not necessarily a good thing, you know? So there's a, there, there are art concerns and I don't know, uh, IP concerns and then actually just durability concerns the way NFTs are set up right now. They're just not durable. Um, so let's, it, it, maybe it's okay to kind of discuss the, you know, discuss it with the idea of NFTs, but really the thing that we're looking at is smart contracts, right? Yeah. If I can, um, Pete, I just want to interject. I, I apologize for introducing it with NFTs because you're right. I'm really talking about smart contracts <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and NFTs have brought that particular model of smart, smart contract of the residual um, thing. So that that's really all I was talking about. Sorry. For yeah, yeah. Complicating I, and with NFTs. Just, you know, just yeah. for everybody. Um, let's make sure we and, and I know you know this, Michael, and I know a bunch of us know this, but <laughs> I guess I have to say this every time we come up to NFTs. NFTs are really interesting. There are a bunch of caution flags. Talk to somebody, talk to enough people that tell you that there are really bad things about NFTs before you start working with NFTs. But then smart contracts are super awesome. And I, I certainly like the idea of um, a provenance chain going back, you know, f uh, maybe to the original creator, maybe actually to all the people uh, intermediating between you and the the the, the uh, originator and, you know, profit sharing back. Um, I, I think that's a wonderful thing. Um, it reminds me, and I think maybe I heard this from John Kelly. Um, uh, uh, maybe it was from somebody else, but uh, one of the one of the smart contracts ideas I heard of a couple of, from a couple of years ago uh, was um, I'm in a rich country, um, uh, America, and I want to send money to someplace that's not as rich uh, in the world. And when I send it, um, I want it to be, uh, my, my observation is when I send it by Western Union or by a, a well-meaning organization or something like that, what happens is the money ends up circling around to the, the males um, in the families instead of the women, and then the males uh, go to the, the liquor store and they plunk down 20 bucks on liquor or whatever, right? Um, so somebody said, I wish we could have money that I would send it over there. And if you take it to the store and try to cash it in for liquor, um, the money says, you know, I don't want to be, I, I'm not exchanged for liquor. You know, you can exchange me for food. You can exchange me for, you know, a sewing machine. You just cannot exchange me for liquor or 
or cigarettes or whatever, right? So that's a, something that you could do with, with smart currency um, that makes a lot of sense. So policy could be baked into our bucks. Interesting. Anybody else with thoughts on this space, not just sort of the NFT part of it, but what Michael put on the table? Yeah, just a, a quick one there. Vermont some years ago instituted a real estate transfer tax um, that was tied to the uh, length of time that you held the property. So it was designed to be both anti-speculative and also recognizing that value accumulation in real estate is not just as your property, but because of what's happening in the community around you. And there's a similar concept that's been floated. I have no idea how far it's gotten to do a, uh, a, 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 a time a duration of holdings based real, um, um, an investment transfer tax. So basically to tax the velocity of trades on mm -hmm. the public markets, which would have some similar kind of logic and similar kind of effect in theory. I don't know where that's gone. But if you look at the velocity of trading over the last 20 or 30 years, it's, it's this ridiculous curve. Uh, you know, and people actually cite their data centers, you know, a block closer to the exchange to cut down on the nanoseconds of difference of data transfer time in order to get trading advantage. So this would be counter to that. Michael, it struck me as very similar related to what you're talking about. And actually, now that you mentioned the Vermont case, I'm just realizing there's a there's a model in, <clears throat> in you know, New York City has the highest in, in, um, concentration of um, co-op structured buildings as opposed to condominiums. And um, the some of the co-op flip tax mm. rules are designed on a slope to um, penalize flipping, mm -hmm. you know, speculative um, investment, so that uh, people pay a surcharge if they sell an apartment quickly. Um, I just put a chat, something in the chat that I'd forgotten, I'd read about before, which is Henry George, mm -hmm. uh, back in England a long time ago, proposed a land value tax, mm -hmm. uh, which basically is a way of making sure that land stays productive because you have to pay tax on your land. And if you didn't put it to work, if you're just kind of holding it for whatever, uh, it's very expensive to do. So you lose, you lose your, your assets. Uh, but, but I think George's is this idea of like, let's, let's get rid of most other taxes and let, let's just focus on land use, uh, which then takes us back into land ownership and a bunch of other really complicated, uh, but equally potentially leverageable uh, topics. Which takes us back to the debt jubilee in the Bible yep. and seeding Mesopotamian societies where every 50 years <clears throat> land would revert to the original tribal holdings, uh, which was a fire break against endless accumulation, which is one of which the the, which know, we don't, which we don't have these days. We don't well, have those fire breaks. I would argue it's one of the, you know, the accumulation without limit is one of the four or five structural flaws in capitalism, which I'll be writing about. And actually, um, I, <laughs> I promised ahead. I'm, I'm way out ahead of my skis, but I promised in my next monthly webinar to focus on those structural flaws. So I'll, I'll post a link. If you but, can. It, but it's not like these uh, structural impediments didn't exist. They have been systematically dismantled again, uh, uh, starting with Reagan. I mean, we had antitrust, we had all those uh, banking regulations and so on that yep. have been systematically taken apart. I, I would say they, this does not date to Reagan. This dates about four or 500 years before Reagan. But Reagan did a really nice job of taking apart some of the guardrails. Um, well, Reagan, uh, was implementing the, Reagan was implementing the Powell Memorial. Yes. Lewis Powell. Lewis, Lewis Powell. Um, yeah. Do people know about that? I wanted to explain. I'm sorry. Oh, me? Um, um, yeah. Lewis Powell is an attorney later to become Supreme Court Justice who was commissioned by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce in the early 1970s uh, to address the challenge of the rising disaffection in the culture with corporations. Uh, and he wrote a, game, a, a brief and a game plan. Um, um, that emphasize, and this is about the same time, of course, that Milton Friedman writes his seminal paper arguing that the only purpose of business is to maximize return to shareholders, no other, yep. uh, which became catechism for a bunch of decades. Um, and uh, Powell proposed a, you know, a propaganda and policy campaign to centralize the role of business in society to remove impediments to business activity. Um, um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm blanking on the details, but uh, you know, deregulation, anti-union, uh, concentration of capital. If, and you look back over the last, what is it, it's now almost 50 years, you look back over the last 50 years, especially in the 70s and 80s, you see that agenda 
being put into place, not just programmatically, but as part of the cultural space of the country and eventually the world. This, you know, what was set out has become normal um, uh, in the discourse. And one of the things that that's, I find really challenging, and I don't have my generations right, but let's say millennial, because everybody blames everything on the millennials, if they don't blame, blame them on the boomers, um, the, 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 um, the libertarianism that we see, particularly out of Silicon Valley, but in general among a cohort um, younger than mine, uh, as kind of a, you know, a normal framework. Government is the enemy, it's all on me, I built this myself, which of course Elizabeth Warren eloquently countered. Um, you know, it's, a, it's a denial of the social network of value creation. Uh, and it's now finally being challenged in some ways. I'll see if I can find a link to a film that uh, my friend Donnie Goldmacher made that dives into this more directly. Point being is that um, social evolution doesn't just happen, there are directed strategic efforts that muster resources to change the norms. And that's, one, and that's one of the challenges we have now. And we have, you know, uh, we have Greta on our side, but we don't have the capital resources of Koch brothers on our side. Anybody else on, on this topic? I feel like there should be somebody here to say, okay, Boomer. <laughs> I offered the opportunity. <laughs> You're totally right. Uh, um, for me, this is a really rich load of what's happened in life, and it's how the sausage got made, and it's it's the the scripts that ate our heads uh, that the left bought. There's a whole there's a whole thread in my brain about how uh, Clinton and uh, and others basically bought the neoliberal agenda and basically became conservatives. And in my brain, it says that Clinton was a pretty good moderate Republican president. Um, and, 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 and so we're, we're, a lot of the things that we're suffering from that got us Trump were, were sown in those, in those particular shifts and movements and fights over the scripts in our heads. Um, cool, let's go, let's go, uh, go ahead, Klaus. Yeah, I mean, what over, overlooked in all this is the, the process of externalities that have been uh, completely disregarded uh, in the process of developing industry, of, of uh, allowing uh, uh, you know, corporations to run freely and unfettered, uh, there was no defender for um, protecting the natural environment. So it's an extractive system where nature is being depleted and has been depleted. Uh, and we are just now realizing the impact of that. And it's very difficult to reverse uh, the, this, this uh, type of, uh, the way of doing business that has become so used, where you just uh, use nature as uh, you know as a capital input. Uh, John, go ahead, Dan. Yeah, uh, I want to figure out how to negotiate the space between Klaus's view of what's happening right now and the implications of what most of us are saying, which are too long term to have an effect. In that space, how should we live? There's the question. Who is answering this question well? Is it philosophers like Harari? Is it Nassim Taleb? I don't think so. Uh, is it ecofeminism? Uh, if so, who? Uh, like who? Who is who is creating? Um, I'll share a link in my brain, which is uh, promising solutions to world problems, where I where I collect up a whole bunch of these things. But but who does who do you all see is creating promising solutions to that question, answers to that question? Uh, not, I mean, problematic, problematic. But just one to add to the list is something called solar punk. Have you heard of this? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so. It, not that I completely get it, but the basic idea is take a bunch of pretty good ideas, but in particular, the idea of decentralization and the idea of higher engagement and higher kind of creating a, a kind of a half tribal circle. So in other words, start small, start with a, com a smaller community, uh, decentralize its, its power using solar, wind, whatever decentralize its food, in other words, you know, do something like the 50 mile rule, 
get some significant percentage of your food locally, um, you're not solving the world problem, but you're building a, a Lego block, a social Lego block that is by itself inherently more resilient to what's coming. You're, you're, you're uh, fulfilling your obligation as far as carbon free or carbon negative, but you're not, and you're, again, you're not trying to convince your state or your federal government to go with you. You're just trying to say, let, me, let us show you here. We're going to do this little experiment here. We'll do another one over there. They'll be a little different. Let's give it a shot and see how it works. Love that. Thanks, John. Um, let's go Bentley, Stacy, Mark. Hello, everyone. Um, just to pop the stack on one of the topics I thought I'd wait till since I was coming up on the end on the um, buying or owning digital goods with um, smart contracts. Uh, just an interesting idea I'm going to throw out doesn't need any discussion is um, have it be a lease of ownership with a continuous bidding. So rather than buying it and then selling it later, I mean, that's, that's the type of thing you can do and it'd be interesting to continuously fund that artist. Um, so that's just something I've been playing around with. And then uh, back talking about um, vaccine misinformation and hesitancy. Um, I'm in the point where I've been working on a project to facilitate large group discussions on contentious issues or large decisions. It's called Gullibot. Um, uh, I'm back looking for feedback on that project. So I'll put a link in. Um, uh, especially anyone who knows anyone who's hesitant about taking the vaccine or even militantly against it. Um, and also if anyone's a mathematician and wants to donate a little time helping me figure out the scoring algorithm um, or someone, uh, anyone interested in helping to kind of market and spread this around to get a larger feedback. Those are the type of help I could use on, on that project. Sounds great. Thanks, Bentley. Any, any mathematicians in the house who want to take a whack at some algorithms? I, saw, uh, I think Ken Homer put up um, from, from an MD who wanted to share the side effects of this Pfizer product and goes through a list of anaphylaxis, sudden death, heart attack, stroke, ventricular arrhythmia, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Uh, and then says, of course, he's talking about Viagra, not the vaccine. And that's about an <laughs> I saw that this morning. It was awesome. Yeah. Great post. Uh, Pete? Um, Bentley, just a, a quick question, and I don't need an answer, but um, uh, make sure that you're hooked up with Trove um, as a project or an organization or, or whatever Vincent would say that you should be um, categorized as. Uh, and and by way of answering or, or suggesting that to Bentley, I, I want to suggest to everybody that um, uh, partly in answer, uh, in, in uh, achingly uh, inadequate answer to, uh, to Doug's question, um, you know, how do we live, um, how do we live now? Uh, I think most, most of the people here are, I, I am, I am, you know, I, I'm either very uncomfortable with the way I, I live my life uh, because I'm not doing enough solar punk stuff, or I feel pretty comfortable with, with it um, because the main part of my life right now is figuring out how humans decentralize and federate and share information and think stronger and stuff like that. So, you know, I'm, I feel like uh, along with the chopping wood and carrying water of my day-to-day -day life, making sure the dog gets walked, uh, making sure that uh, uh, that I eat healthy food, uh, even if I have to buy suboptimal food or from uh, through a suboptimal system, um, I feel like I'm working towards, you know, stumbling towards a solution very inadequately, at least. But I'm not uncomfortable with that usually. And I guess another way of answering Doug's question is, how do you live with this, the kind of the psychological rift between, you know, everything is all effed up and, you know, <laughs> uh, and we should all just end it all right now? Um, or, you know, how do we carry on and, and know that it's not going to be enough and yet still have hope for the future? Um, long story short, I got myself a little bit distracted there. Projects like um, Bentley's and exist in a matrix of 
uh, federation soup is the way I think of it, um, uh, around OGM and around Kiko Lab and around Collective Sense Commons and around you know massive, massive stuff. There's a bunch of we're we're all in this factor. Thanks for, uh, thanks for your smiling face, Michael. Um, uh, uh, we are we are slowly shuffling along with everything else. We're slowly shuffling to have uh, project directories. Uh, so the one that's farthest along right now is is Vincent's Trove. Um, so if you're working on something or if you're looking for things to work on, get yourself into Trove. Um, at some point. Those all of that information will sluice around over to massive wikis and things like that too. Um, they're not quite; it's not quite doing that yet. But um, but let's let's OGM do all of that stuff together, right? Let's have projects and organizations and and decentralized humans federating um, as part of OGM and get yourself in trove right away. Thanks, Pete. Um, let's go, Stacy Mark Simon. So when i heard the word desperation that sort of goes through all of my different streams of thought lately um since i've been able to be out and about more and i've been having conversations with real world people i've heard a lot of stories about people who have friends or family or kids that haven't gone back to work because they're collecting got unemployment and you know what what struck me though is that it's reduced the stress in so many people. And it's actually led to a better quality of life. And so this morning, we'll see if you could figure out my brain works in many, it, it all has to come together. But I was reading Jerry's post and I started, um, I started looking at the comments and I was listening to some of the TED talks that other people commented on regarding you know, what we could do. I think it was like a hundred solutions, something like that. And as I was listening, well, first of all, let me go back. When I was a young mother, I used to watch Oprah religiously because all, I was at home, all of my friends, not, none of them had children, they were working. So Oprah was my friend. The best part of it would be once a year when she would have this giveaway. And I would watch this giveaway and I would be elated for the rest of the day. And I later realized I was picking up the energy of all that joy that was there. And so in my life, I really look at emotions almost like a virus, like they do spread. So let me leave that as a background because I don't think that business leaders think enough about the costs of stress or the benefits of reducing stress. So that brings me to the part of the video where I I was washing dishes, so I wasn't listening 100%, but apparently there's a better way to do refrigeration. And it just made me think, how great to give people these refrigerators. You still need businesses making them. People get to, you know, they don't have to worry about how they're going to replace their refrigerator because now they have a brand new refrigerator and it's something good for the planet. So... I'm rambling, but that's really what I'm thinking about. I just would love to see, um, I'd love to see people focus on the benefit of making people happy. Cause I, I just think it's overlooked and underrated and I'm complete on that. Casey, thank you. Thanks also for pointing to my inquiry on, on the book of the face, uh, because I'm trying to collect up stories about, not stories, but what are short nuggets of video mostly that explain what this new world looks like that are counterintuitive that are you know that that will take us forward into living in a new way that kind of answer uh, the question uh, we just asked here so how do we how do we go there um, and I had another thought and I've just lost it I apologize um, so let's go Mark Simon Gill um, thank you um, <clears throat> gonna surf on the virus and 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 the vaccine um i met uh two weeks ago and spoke more deeply yesterday with what we uh what we call a, a poop lady uh it's a poop doctor someone who studies um human microbiomes in the guts 
And the reason we connected is simply because um, people in the Amazon have uh, the most complete gut microbiome that we can find. So it's really interesting, um, whether it is a gut microbiome, a skin microbiome, to compare um, what, what we lost as modern humans um, compared to them and what implication it has in um, the many illnesses that plague us, whether they're mental, they're um, um, neuro or, you know, uh, gut, anything. And um, what, what, what she found out by comparing um, modern gut microbes and traditional people's gut microbes was that once you get, and there is a lot, there is not like that simple, it's not as simple as this, but um, usually when you get vaccinated, you will lose some of the essential bacteria in your guts. She found this as an explanation to autism, for instance, but not just that, Parkinson, Alzheimer, and others. So what she is specializing in is uh, poop transplant. Um, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm pointing to that, um, just one of the things that has always frustrated me with the discourse on vaccines is that we don't pay enough attention to the side effects. So we. We have a fund, uh, and, and, and that fund is, exists in most of countries that I know of. Um, if people have um, bad reaction to a vaccine, usually within three months, um, then you apply for something and they gave you something, but there is absolutely no follow-up, no studies, no effort to understand why this happens. And that contributes to uh, feeding anti-vaxxers anti on, you know, we shouldn't get vaccine because it destroys something and we get sick. Um, so it, it was, it was really a very, uh, very rich, insightful conversation. And um, she identified a few bacteria that, that, that do contribute to, or their absence contribute to um, um, Alzheimer and, and autism and other illnesses like this. Um, so I wanted to, to share that with you guys. And um, last but not least, um, I mentioned a few times someone by the name of uh, Kenyan, Cyrus Rhodes. Um, she's the heir of Anne-Marie Cyrus, who um, created a deco village in Indian Canyon um, near Hollister, California. And um, so she finally um, got, got traction in, um, in bringing forward a vision once she takes over her mothers. And that's coming very, very soon. And Mary is having health issues. Uh, and Mary was a um, um, Native American activist, very powerful in, in, in trying to get lands for Californian Native Americans that have been dispossessed. And um, so sh she has an ask, and I don't know if anyone here can, can help, but she needs, um, she needs a lot of things from, from legal support to uh, web design, copywriting, grant writing, um, strategy and organizing. So um, I know all of you are super busy, but if you know of or you yourself would love to learn more, I'm going to post a couple of links in the matter most and please uh, do contact me. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. I was just going to suggest you post in the matter most and that, that way <clears throat> whoever's interested could go, can go ahead and contact her. Um, a couple of quick things. I'm a big, uh, I've never experienced, but I'm a huge fan of fecal transplants. I think that our microbiome is a magical thing. I'm a little puzzled about vaccines destroying uh, antibiotics definitely wipe out your, your bacteria. That's like a tip. One, one of the horrible things about antibiotics is that like, boom, you just, it's like dropping a hand grenade inside your system. Vaccines cause your system to generate a whole bunch of, in the case of the mRNA vaccines, spike proteins that are, that, that are very particular to the virus. They don't 
it, unless there's weird interactions, which there could be, they don't wipe out anything else. They don't destroy stuff. They don't, they're just making your body hyper produce a particular thing. So I'm completely confused that somebody would, would associate <clears throat> vaccines with wiping out parts of your immune system. And then um, years ago, I had an idea <clears throat> that people in favelas and people in Amazon jungles probably have more resilient, like uh, people like us probably wouldn't survive more than a week in a favela because we'd drink the water and we would like shit our brains out and die um, if we didn't have immediate medical attention because our systems are just not used to it. I grew up in Peru. My mom was in the American expat community. She watched as the other parents were boiling the water for their kids. She's like, we're not doing that. So, so the first, the first while I had colics and whatever, but then I could drink from a hose on the street and I'd be fine. Um, and so, so I had an idea for a couple of businesses. One was, is selling your poop a viable revenue source for people in very hard put places in the world? And B, why doesn't anybody have a fecal bank, basically a, a hot backup and transfer for people? Like imagine that for you personally, at a moment of peak health, you could bank some of your poop cryogenically and then bring it back when you when you had just gone through like a, a, a huge regime uh, regimen of, of uh, antibiotics or something like that that wiped you out. You could sort of bring your own poop back in for yourself. Anyway, Pete, then Mark. Um, I like the, the fecal banking idea, Jerry. Um, and and there's a there's a thing about microbiomes that they're they're complex they're individual and probably even your microbiome biome from now may or may not help you you know two years from now when you're better or worse or or whatever so i i think there's a lot of um it's not a plug and play solution um absolutely uh and then the other thing is uh just on a quick on a quick search, uh, there is a, a British, British Medical Journal uh, article. Actually, it's a letter. Um, uh, there have been some um, potentially uh, potential interactions between the vaccine and and, and gut biomes, especially wow. in, in people who are fra uh, frail. Um, so, um, happens. Thank you. Uh, some promising research a while ago was that they were taking microbiome samples from fin mice and putting them in obese mice and with no change in diet the mice were losing weight so and then microbiomes also affect our moods so imagine maybe mood transplants which is all kind of strange but the microbiome is insanely powerful and we call our gut our second brain for many good reasons including the fact that there are like a huge amount of neurons around your your gut uh, uh, more than we think um, sorry, Mark, back to you in the booth. No, thank you for saying that. I was, I was going to uh, also um, share the same. Uh, what, what, what we've seen, and I've worked also with um, Larry Wise, I don't know if uh, someone that I'm trying to, to bring into that group on, on, on Thursday morning, he's such an interesting character, um, created a, a, a skincare product line um, with microbes, fermented microbes. Um, and we went um, went to the Amazon and um, looked at the what happened when um, some of my indigenous friends would live for a week in the city and they started developing um, some some scar tissues on their skin. Um, probably, you know, maybe due to the water or suddenly they're using soap, which they never use when they're in the jungle. Um, and, and, and so it, it, it changes very quickly, um, the gut, the skin, nose, uh, mouth, etc. cetera. Um, the, the, I, think, I think what she was pointing to was that, um, yes, as Pete was mentioning, really individualistic microbes, um, and, and she needs to go much further, this poop lady, into studying on a large scale which exactly which exact microbes are missing after an intervention like vaccines or antibiotics or you know change of food uh, uh, diet um, the food diet is, is changes your gut microbe microbiome very quickly so she's she's in the process of doing that but the first um, test that she has uh, performed conducted uh, showed that there are some uh, my cards that are missing after a vaccine. Thanks, Mark. Uh, 
what you just said reminded me of a talk that I saw Danny Hillis give years ago. It's online. I'll, I'll put a link to it. Um, but he's not a life scientist or a doctor, but, and he was kind of sweating and trembling a little bit when he gave this talk, but he was talking about proteomics and basically the protein mix that's in our blood. And his talk was about cancer. And he said, cancer is a verb. Your body cancers, your body goes into cancering mode where cells start to overproduce. And, and, and it, I don't remember what else he was saying in the talk, but it seemed like a really interesting approach toward the way we see the evolution of these diseases and what's going on. And it had nothing to do with microbiomes or anything like that, but, but it was a challenge to like approaches to, to seeing disease. Um, let's go, we're, we're starting to get well along in our time. Let's go Simon Gill Pete. Hey, Simon. Hi. Um... I'm here, following on from Peter was saying, because of the, uh, the Trove site, I just clicked on the link, <laughs> it looked interesting. Yay, love I was, that. I, I was gonna leave, but it's certainly been very, very interesting. It is also, I, st I also stayed, because uh, I spent an hour and a half listening to your your uh, your conversation on um, generative commons, because uh, I'm very interested in uh, how, how you build a business if you fundamentally believe in degrowth. So that's kind of what I'm working on, which again ties into what Pete was talking about because it has to be at a local level, um, meeting people's needs without the profit motive, hollowing out capitalism by using its tools against itself for everybody's benefit. So okay. Kind of, kind can we just print? Can you? Can we just print that as a motto? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I'm working on something called um, Chrysalis Communities. Chrysalis being the transformative space between something which is dying or thinks it's dying, but then regenerates into something completely different. Can you can you describe chrysalis a little bit for us? Well, the, it, it's just the idea that you know within communities we need to transition, and the chrysalis is the best metaphor I've come up with for that transitional space because it's just it, it looks like something's dying but it, it goes it, it, it transforms shuts down and it turns it turns into goo it just turns into goo like they can't quite figure out what's going scientists are looking going what well maybe that's Sounds what we're like doing a little prince maybe we're all turning into goo but maybe that... yeah that'd be good sorry metaphor ahead. metaphorically you're going after something more like the little prince yeah well, yeah Simon, thank you. Thanks for being here. Um, Simon, are you on the Mattermost chat? I'm not. I'm on Mattermost, but not in your group. Good. So um, I'll put a link in. We have a channel for the Generative Commons conversation. And if you follow that, if you join that channel, we're going to have recurring calls around that topic. And you're, I, we'd love it if you joined. But just one very last thing, a cornerstone of what I'm working on is, is, is differentiating money as a medium of exchange and a store of value. I think that's where a big problem lies. Um, I've got mechanisms to achieve that, to Love invest, that. invest in things locally. So actually local assets, rather than universal basic kingdom, universal basic assets underwritten by local assets owned collectively, you know, with the seven generation principles, stakeholders. Thanks. Uh, we're, we're, on, we're all on, on these kinds of paths trying to figure out what, where this goes. Um, and, and just a wild card here is what if there were insanely cheap, you know, energy too cheap to meter, except it's not from nuclear like we were promised 40 years ago, but it's from solar and wind and regenerative power. And that changes a whole bunch of equations, including the brute force way of getting water back into the world, which is desal, right? If, if there's a lot of water at the coastlines everywhere and you can cheaply turn it into potable water or useful water, then that changes a whole bunch of stuff right there. But, but there's a whole bunch of these things that are that we're on the cusp of and and we don't understand the implications and I'm, again I'm trying to harvest who's who's got really interesting takes on all those kinds of levers and those those kinds of uh, things that are changing I'm, I'm trying to collect those up into into well, some narratives we can browse it's the end of business the end of trade we don't need it you know we need to evolve beyond that surely you know it's, it's all about competitive mechanisms to get things done and surely we're smarter than that We'll see where it goes. And there are lots of good philosophical discussions there as well. Uh, let, let's go um, Gil, Pete, Judy. Yeah, Jerry, let's have a session focused just on collecting those ideas that you just asked for. Okay. Because there's, uh, you know, there's a lot there and a lot of us have pieces of thread. So let's do that. Um, um, that. 
I, I, I'm, in a, I'm in a rich love-hate relationship with this group and others like it. I find that I'm spending more and more of my time in really rich generative Zoom chats with diverse groups of people on different topics. Uh, just moved in, into, in, into Kiko Lab this week for the first time. And so there's another thing on the list. I feel like I'm in graduate school or like I want to be in graduate school and just read and write all the time um, and think. Uh, and there's also work to do in the world. So I'm you know, in a struggle with that balance. It's a delightful struggle. Um, thank you guys for your piece of that particular puzzle. Um, related to that, I'm, I've, been working, I've been working hard lately on focusing me on, you know, despite all of this rich bubbling up of everything on moving forward on a couple of projects uh, that I'm wanting to pursue. Um, two in particular, I'm having a hard time choosing between them and I think I'm finally finding some synergy and I'll talk more about that another time when there's more time. Uh, uh, but basically, you know, basically to do with um, um, generating leadership and moving capital in support of the world that we want. Um, in the Focus Me project, I have uh, thanks uh, uh, thanks to Pete, among others. I'm looking at personal knowledge management systems and productive writing systems, thinking both about tools and processes. I'm kind of going down a rabbit hole, Pete. Uh, uh, you know, I'm play, playing with Brain Jerry, but that doesn't seem like a good. That seems like a knowledge environment more than a writing environment. Uh, yeah. And, and so I'm looking at Obsidian and various other things and trying to find my way through that, but also remembering um, Isaac Asimov, who did it with typewriters, you know, and a U-shaped desk with six or eight typewriters arrayed around it. And he had a chair on wheels and he would work on whichever book was his mood in that moment and then flip to the next one and back to the next one. So uh, I, don't have a, I don't have a physical space big enough to do that. So I'm trying to craft a, a digital space. For I, I yeah. didn't know that's how he'd set up his office. He was an insanely prolific writer thousand books right yeah yeah, yeah insanely that's, that's how we did it the other insanely prolific writer i've come across lately is lurman and the whole zettelkasten system um so i've been checking that out and i'm not sure i want to go down that rabbit hole if anybody has experience with that i would love to hear from you uh, lurman was a guy who built a system of uh, a, a physical filing system in what was called a slip box which is what zettelkasten means where there was you know, one card per theme arrayed in a box with, you know, with handwritten numerological linkings between it. There are software applications of that that you know, people are enthusiastic about some of them. I don't know if I wanna go there. So that's kind of one area of inquiry that I'd love to pursue further with any of you who are interested. Um, on the project side, I've been working, focusing increasingly on climate finance, on how do we actually mobilize the capital to do what needs to be done and one observation is that uh, everything underway right now is woefully inadequate uh, in scale and even in grasp of the problem. Um, here in the Bay Area, uh, you know, there's, there's some assessment of what kind of government funding state and federal that could be mobilized to adapt the Bay to rising seas. And they're coming up with numbers like you know, 5% of what they think is the budget. And we think the budget is, you know, is multiples or maybe orders of magnitude too low. So, Huge problem there. So I've been thinking into that a lot. Um, I've, 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 I've invented a couple of ideas, one having to do with carbon pricing, one having to do with, with value generation around climate adaptation. Um, I think one of them is gonna stay private and one of them I will put into public domain, uh, but I really need a conversation with a very good patent attorney. To understand what are the options? What are, where's the leverage? What's the right way to play this? If any of you have suggestions of that, um, um, hopefully, you know, sympathetic to our norms and modes here would be great, but I'm uh, looking for suggestions there because these things have been sitting on the shelf and need to get out in the world in one form or another. Um, well, it turns yeah. out that Lorelai, who's in our community, is a patent agent and knows a bunch about patents. I don't think she's a patent attorney, but she may know some people who are reliable and who could be helpful. And a patent agent might be a good enough starting point, so I would welcome that, that connection. Um, um, I'm also wondering, and maybe some of you have been in this territory, I'm, between Jane and I, we're constantly generating ideas that are interesting, would be good projects or good businesses or good something. And instead of just sitting on them, um, it seems that we could, on the one hand, just throw them out in the world, Johnny Appleseed, just strew them out and see what happens. On another hand, we could maybe do a little mini personal incubator and say, here's a project, who wants to take it on? 
uh, take half of it, take two thirds of it, whatever it is. You do some kind of split between the generators of the idea and the, and the developers and perpetrators of the idea. Uh, and I wonder if anyone has seen models like that that have well, worked well. They're really like Bill Gross and the Idea Lab yeah. uh, back, back in the 90s did that, except it was really centered around Bill Gross. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it was a huge mechanism that churned out startups and tried to, you know, tried to change the world and invented. Uh, GoTo.com was one of the early search engines that came out of that, which invented some piece of what exists in Google now, et cetera, et cetera. But, yeah. but that's, that, I don't think that's the road you want to you follow. Well, it's not, because Bill also was not just a, uh, an idea generator, it's also a venture capital firm. Exactly. And I don't have the assets to be a venture, venture capital firm. So I'm looking at more of a, a collaborative development where someone comes in and their sweat equity and networks and so forth bring value and our ideas and, and networks and experience bring value. And there's some kind of split, but where we're not, we're not investing substantial capital. We're investing ideas and relationships. They're investing, you know, I, I experience relationships and capacity and sweat. So yeah. I'm looking for that. And that may be a relevant idea for a lot of the stuff that we're talking about in the OGM people lab, et cetera, communities as a way to propagate stuff in the world. And I have a similar instinct and desire. And also I'm hoping some of those ideas might be stood up on top of OGM as OGM starts to grow up and, and get out of toddler phase and become an adolescent, that, that it might be the home or container or vessel or platform for some of those, some of those ideas in different ways. Yeah. So. And, and, and last, last but not least, all of this would depend on, on digital smart digital contracts of the sort that he was talking about earlier. A, cool. a, buddy, a buddy of mine has just started a, an enterprise. Um, uh, we had the first uh, online session for it yesterday and he said, he pointedly said, we did not create, this is not an organization. We haven't created a C Corp or an LLC or anything of that sort. What we've got is six founders with contracts between them all. I don't know if they're smart contracts, but the notion of, of, co of, 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 of forming a collaborative effort based around smart contracts rather than based on a corporate structure is a pretty intriguing one. Mm -hmm. That's it. Um, thank you. Let's go. Uh, we're going to run out of time here. We're going to dive. I've got another call. I'm supposed to be on 15 minutes ago. Um, so, Wes, I'll see you next week. Uh, thank you. Uh, and we're going to run out of time here. Let's go, Pete, Judy, Scott. Hi, I'm going to hit return on uh, my Mattermost post. Um, and because Gil just went, I, I can answer a bunch of things for him real quick. Um, maybe I'll catch it on the recording, maybe not. Um, Zettelkasten, I think, has been more or less replaced by the by, by like things like Obsidian. So I, I think definitely be inspired by Zettelkasten and then use something like Obsidian. Uh, there's a bunch of people who have worked on that. Uh, for a tool like Obsidian or a tool like Rome or something like that, it turns out that you need not just the tool, even the brain actually, uh, you need a methodology of working with it. Um, and uh, there's, there are a lot of people who have published their methodologies or parts of their methodologies. Um, uh, so I don't have a good entree to that, um, except maybe to say one, one person who's mostly selling his uh, knowledge and mentoring about um, uh, um, a workflow to use something like Obsidian or Rome with uh, is Nick Milo. Um, in the olden days, like two years ago, it was Tiago Forte. Um, now it's Nick Milo uh, with Linking Your Thinking. Um, so he has an expensive seminar that he gives and, and uh, uh, interactive mentoring and things like that. Um, I'm not sure that I would recommend that, but uh, I think he's also generated a fair amount of like um, public residue that that's interesting. Uh, if you go on YouTube and search for, you know, Obsidian Rome uh, or linking your thinking or um, uh, Zettelkasten. Personal, personal, knowledge, personal management, knowledge management. Network knowledge management. There's a bunch of other terms too. Knowledge ecosystems, knowledge gardens, all that kind of stuff. If you just search for a little while, you'll find people talking about it and you'll start to see at the, you'll, you'll start to recognize that there are methodologies of using it. Um, uh, I have good news to report with Obsidian. I'm getting super productive in it now that I've tweaked it up a little bit and I've, I've kind of settled down on getting a methodology, methodology to it. Um, I'm also super excited to report that um, one of the people I've been working with who started kind of from zero with the idea of hyper knowledge and starting from zero with the idea of Obsidian 
has poked around enough and I think it's only taken her like three hours or something like that you know four hours elapsed time um, but she's not very technical she doesn't really know how to use a bunch of the computer stuff but now she's starting to link her thinking and and it's um, uh, it's wonderful to see so uh, by the way uh, just a quick aside Nick Milo's linking your thinking uh, is very similar to a phrasing that we used to use link your thinking um, uh, back in the wiki day so it's it's not his exactly mm -hmm. um, uh, Gil asked about patent attorneys, and I have kind of two things. One of them is look at generative commons, um, and and generative commons is going to be figuring out what patents mean and how to do something better than patents for the world. Um, uh, and also, I, I would second second uh, the recommendation of asking Lorelai. Lorelai is probably well placed to know some patent attorneys, and I think she talked about one to me. Um, uh, and then ideas, Gil asked an interesting question. We've got a bunch of uh, great ideas and they should be out in the world more. And my answer to that is I, this, uh, this comes from a lot of Silicon Valley experience, actually Silicon Valley uh, entrepreneurial experience and, and, um, and VC experience. Uh, the, the thing that VCs have recognized for decades is that there's not a lack of ideas, there's a lack of execution. Um, so uh, the, a, a good idea may be a good idea and maybe a useful idea. And the, the best way to kind of leverage it and put it out in the world um, is probably actually not to try to take a percentage of it, um, uh, it with a caveat, but I'll explain in, in a sec. Um, the thing to do is to do a really good write-up of it or do one or two experiments that show that the idea has promise. Um, the more experiments that you do that show that an idea has promise, the, the more value it has. It goes from probably essentially zero value to incremental value for every experiment. Publish that on Medium, publish that on Twitter to talk about an OGM and Kika lab, get it out there. Um, uh, an idea by itself, and especially about the context of why it would work and why it's interesting and, and stuff like that is, is pretty useless. And then there's no way for you to know how to get it to the right person. The, the best way to do it is to publish it and make it widespread and get a bunch of other people talking about it and, and hope somebody picks it up. Jerry. Really briefly on that, and you're reminding me for years, I've, I've wished that there was some kind of a pipeline or a broadcast system that would put these kinds of ideas in front of students worldwide, because there's a whole bunch of students out there scratching their heads going, gosh, I need to do a term paper, I need to do a, a PhD, I need to do a project for this school. For the, and, and they're given meaningless tasks and, and stupid ideas to go work with. And in this way, we could figure out which of them is like really good at getting things done at project management, at whatever, whatever. But, but if we could marry up these ideas with young humans who need to figure out what they're going to do in life, that might actually work out really well. It's, it's an interesting idea and I like it. Um, my, my observation there is that the problem isn't dearth of ideas. Students themselves have tons of ideas, right? Great ideas, probably actually some of the best ideas. Um, the problem there is the educational system, which says that, I'm sorry, you can't work you know, you can't work with other people. You can't build a project with people. You can't, you know, we have to grade you on things that we know about already. So I'm going to teach you old dead knowledge from 20 years ago or 50 years ago or 200 years ago. And then I can score you on how well you understand some, you know, hoary old thing that doesn't matter anymore. Mm, right. um, so the problem there is the educational system and not a dearth of ideas. Um, uh, I think it's a great idea to have, you know, an I, I, idea, ideation idea. Uh, actually, probably, I, I would probably guess that um, us old farts um, are going to get more ideas and more richness by um, going into an I, idea tumbler with a bunch of, of t uh, high schoolers. Um, you know, I, I could say, well, I have this great idea for knowledge management, blah, 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 and I've thought about it for decades, and, you know, and I'm sure within within you know half an hour i'd have 10 more brilliant ideas coming out of a, a group of you know teenagers from you know the inner city or something like that um uh so ideas get them out there don't sit on them don't try to monetize them if it's a really good idea what ends up happening a lot of the time and enough time to make it worth your while if i spread 10 ideas or a thousand ideas out into the world and two of them or three of them hit um a smart person executing on that deal will come find me and go, I think you know more about this idea than you probably published. Help me figure it out more. And that's when 
we can talk about value exchange and monetization and all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, so now to jump up to my uh, bullet points, um, uh, balance of this group is really, this particular group, this call is really hard for me. It's really hard to look at a bunch of males in this group and, and stay. Um, and I don't know, I don't know what to do about that yet, but it's, it's tipping more and more to like, you know, I just can't make this call. I'm sorry. I love you all. Um, uh, with the exception of Simon, I don't love you yet because I don't know you very well. But literally every person here, every face here is near and dear to me. I love you all. I've wor worked with you all. It's all of you are very important to me and we cannot keep working like this. This is messed up and uh, counterproductive and let's fix it or, you know, or literally I think I'm going to have to stop coming. Um, and, and I'm not, I don't know how to fix it. I, 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 my, my, my working, my working thesis for how to fix a group like this is uh, you don't start like this. You know, you, you can't, it's, you start with initial conditions and you grow a group that's diverse. Um, and it's like uh, actually systematics, the, my favorite Bible, it's, you know, you can't, you can't turn a complex system into a better system. You have to start with a small system that works and, and grow it from there. Um, uh, hyperscale so social structures and humanity. I, I, I did a great riff on the Kiko Lab call this week. I'm going to go, go back and harvest it. Um, the, the big problems, the, the root of the problem to work on is that um, social structures got away from us, you know, somewhere between 100 years ago and 1,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago. And, and it's, you, you can't change the system inside the system. You actually have to go figure out how we're going to deconstruct social structures. Um, and then big social structures that exist are going to fight that. And so that's where I see the, you know, the war for humanity. Um, and I don't use the, the word war lightly. Um, so obviously decentralization and federation is, you know, kind of the counter to that. Um, all of us are working really hard on that. Uh, the artificial intelligence conversation in um, the mailing list has been super interesting to me. Um, I, I like there's uh, artificial intelligence is a flag word for flag phrase for me because uh, it doesn't have anything to do with intelligence. Um, uh, AI right now is not smart at all. Um, uh, it's just uh, interestingly scalable and does some cool stuff, but it's not smart at all. And so the problem I think that we have with AI, quote unquote AI, um, is that we let a lot of these tools, um, technologies be autonomous. Um, so there's different kinds of autonomy. Uh, if I, I tell it, you know, if I have a drone that can sense and react to stimuli and I let it fly around and shoot people, if I put a gun on it, um, there's nothing intelligent in there. I made the choice to you know, enable a, a gun hooked up to an autonomous sensor system do do things, right? And that's going to be bad news, right? Um, another kind of autonomy is actually scale. So Facebook has a lot of AI working against humanity, not because that they hate humanity, it's just too stupid to know what to do with their scale of a AI. But that's a place where the autonomy of the AI is because they wanted to do stuff at scale, right? I want to Mark Zuckerberg and his infinite wisdom said, I want to affect the lives of billions of people and I want to change their minds for, oh, I guess it's for the paying customers. And then the paying customers are people that we probably don't want to be changing the minds of billions of people. The problem there is not the AI. The problem is not really even the algorithms or anything like that. The problem is that Mark Zuckerberg and his team of technologists turned that technology loose. Um, it's kind of like putting a, a machine gun in the middle of Times Square uh, with a, a motor underneath it and wondering what's going to happen. You know, I think, I'm guessing, that's not going to be a, bad, a good thing. So an AI is not any smarter than a machine gun on a rotating platform, uh, really. Uh, so it does some interesting things. It can do sensing and it can do um, actuating, but uh, the sensing and the actuating isn't the problem. The people who design the sensing and the actuating or grew it, actually, now you grow AI in a, in a vat, basically. Um, that's not the problem. The problem is whoever frickin' put the machine gun in the middle of Times, Times Square, right? Why would you do that? And, you know, if somebody did, 
shouldn't we like say, hey, I, I don't think, you know, one machine gun or a billion machine guns is a good plan. You know, let's figure out how to how to stop it. Um, uh, so then my last thing, I've, I'm, I keep wishing I, I've, you know, we've, we, I think all of us kind of bump into this, you know, once in a while. Uh, if we had a way to do community currency or a local uh, exchange uh, system or something like that, I, I think we would be better off. There's lots of reasons we haven't done it and they make sense. But if we had something like that, um, then uh, it would be really cool. And I, I wish that for that. I don't have another good way to you know, make that happen or, or even pick the right system, but um, something to, to go for. Uh, thank you. Thank you. You are, you are muted, Jerry. Thank you, sorry. Um, we are at 90 minutes, so I'm afraid we have to wrap the call. And my apologies to six of us who didn't get to jump in and check in. Um, I'll try to start with uh, those of you next call, next week. And um, when we started these calls, the initial invites were all like, hey, if you're a white guy like me, try to bring somebody else who isn't like you into these calls. And that kind of failed miserably. Um, so there was a, a lot of intention for to create more diversity at the start of this, Pete. And I appreciate your pointing it out. And every now and then we stop and go, damn it. Uh, what are we doing? And then we're, we're still uh, in this situation. So anything that any one of us can do to improve this uh, situation will help the entire uh, community. And, and uh, so let's, let's all kind of think about that and invite our friends in and whatever, because the most powerful social change agent in my head is a friend taking a friend by the hand to try something new. Lots of, lots of big things have happened in the world, good and bad by exactly that little dynamic. Um, so with that, I thank you all for a terrific call. This has been like wild and I've been gardening stuff into my brain. Uh, I'll, po I'll post the, the video to YouTube as usual and uh, see you all uh, in a week. Thank you. Judith, <laughs> would you still, I had emailed you the day that you asked me to meet, but I never heard back from you. Did you receive it? Um, probably, but I've been, I had a few health issues and I got behind on email. And so that's probably what happened. Um, okay. And then I had such a mountain to go through that it has taken a while. Um, well, we're recording, so I don't want. I won't talk more. Should I just email you again? Sure. Okay, it's going to come under Stacy Kara, so okay. you might not recognize. Okay, take care. Perfect. Bye.